Thank you, uh, Will and Sean, for your kind invitation. Uh, this is a true honor. Um, so I will be talking uh, last video uh, using robotic repairs. I do robotic, laparoscopic, open. Um, and I also wanted to thank here my uh, fellow Javier Otero did all the editing. So uh, he took actually three different uh, hernia repairs and edited it for me. Uh, okay, here we go, disclosures. All right, so an inguinal hernia procedure is something that really uh, we do very well. Um, and even though 90% of inguinal hernia repairs in this country are actually done open, so Matt totally wins as far as numbers, uh, most surgeons when surveyed would actually have a minimally invasive repair if they had a hernia. Uh, so. Um, then considering, you know, things, what can we uh, improve on because uh, the recurrence rates are so low uh, that really most of the focus when it comes to inguinal hernia has uh, come on pain. Um, and uh, pain is something that's actually fairly, uh, fairly significant. About 35% of patients after inguinal hernias can have pain that can last longer than a year. Um, and really, uh, do we discuss this with our patients preoperatively when we see young patients and tell them that they may, 30% of them will have postoperative pain that may be long term. Um, so it's no surprise that any uh, one of these hernia congresses that you go to, you'll actually see a lot of lectures on groin pain. So what can we do to improve this? Um, so I'm just going to list a few benefits and then I'm going to show you the repair so you can see for yourself. I think uh, with robotic repair, you're definitely going to see better visualization. Uh, you control the camera 100% of the time, so you don't have to spin your head like this as, uh, as they're turning, uh, the, <laughs> your horizon is uh, changing. Um, your RVUs are going to be same as laparoscopic. You don't have to put any tax in the abdominal wall because it's really easy to suture. Uh, and if you're, uh, you can get rid of some of the um, some of the staplers tax, uh, so you can decrease the costs. And then I think it's also a lot easier to teach trainees how to do things robotically than laparoscopically. It's so easy uh, to take their, to take it away from them, fix something, and you know you don't have to keep switching sides, etc. I think in general, if you're trying to debate people, uh, you really, it's poor taste if you try to use your children or animals uh, in videos. Um, so, um, look, he even has robot socks right there, in case those are from Amazon. Hey, honey, I thought you were doing homework. I'm ready to do an England or hernia. <laughs> What, on the robot? Yeah, robot's the best. I mean, so, you know, these kids, I don't know, we, we spend, you know, we try to limit the iPad to 30 minutes a day, but you know, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at something, and I just sat down on my calculator and calculated by the time he's 18, if he only uses the iPad for 30 minutes, that's gonna be almost 4,000 hours. So, you know, if they're, uh, these kids are gonna be able to do this uh, very well, even if we really stick to that. Uh, so I'm gonna switch now and tell you how I do this procedure, and I essentially do it very similarly to the way I do it laparoscopically. Uh, usually the dissection, the mesh placement, then the preperitoneal uh, closure. So uh, as far as port placement, uh, you can see in this patient that you can go through the umbilicus like you would laparoscopically if they have an umbilical hernia, you can go straight through there, and I feel like I can always find an umbilical hernia on everybody. Uh, now, if they don't have an umbilical hernia and you're doing this robotically, I think it is nice if you can put that pore just a few centimeters above the umbilicus because it's gonna give you a little bit more room to suture so your camera is not so close uh, to where you're suturing. Uh, so this is the first part. You can see uh, in this patient, uh, they have a lot of incarcerated momentum, so you can uh, reduce that pretty easily. Uh, you can see that the mesh is already in there. I get in uh, laparoscopically, uh, I take a look and I drop everything in there uh, while I'm at the patient uh, bedside. And then I never have to go back to bedside again. I just sit at the console the whole time. So that kind of helps me save a little bit of time. You can see here that I'm taking the peritoneum down, and I do this a little bit differently, I think, than some of the laparoscopic repairs uh, that have been shown. I actually dissect medially first visualize the pubis, and then I go laterally. Uh, I minimize the dissection on my uh, uh, peritoneum as far as the, the length of the incision. 
Uh, and uh, you can see here, I'm just kind of trying to get sp strip this hernia sac down. But can you just see how good the visualization is and compare this to laparoscopy? I mean, and I do a lot of laparoscopic repairs, uh, but it's almost like you're driving with your windshield being dirty and you're okay with that, you know? And I think this is really, I mean, it's just, it's pretty, it's fun. Um, and it's certainly much easier to teach. So if you're an open surgeon, I think it's really easy uh, to learn this, you know. Uh, once, but, but the anatomy is um, a little bit different. So I think learning to see it from the other uh, direction, it does take a little bit of time. I think the, uh, lapro um, laparoscopic or minimally invasive inguinal hernias are really probably the hardest to teach. Uh, I tell all of my trainees it's easier to teach them how to do a Nissen than an inguinal hernia. Um, you can see this patient, you can see that transfer sal strips off so nicely. You can just see it very well. Uh, big hernia sac. And uh, so the peritoneum bladder is all down. This is just kind of dissecting this huge uh, hernia defect. You know, and you certainly develop that tactile feedback. I think people, uh, you know, the more of these you do, you really get to, you know, feel essentially by, by looking and uh, it really uh, is not an issue. So, and you can save a lot of time, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But once you clear this off, you know, I just make sure that I make a huge prepared needle space. Uh, so first dissecting down in the space of retsias, then all the way out laterally, uh, because I really want to put a big piece of mesh in there. Uh, and just really uh, clean this. You can see the peritoneum down stripping off nicely and just getting this huge space here. All right, so once you're done with that, um, so uh, a little bit of data, I want to kind of uh, put a few studies in here just to show you because uh, there's a lot of people uh, comparing their robotic repairs to laparoscopic repairs. So this was a single surgeon uh, experience looking at robotic repairs versus laparoscopic. And there was a little bit longer time in the robotic group. Um, however, the recovery time for laparoscopic patients uh, was a, a significantly longer. Uh, and the pain scores were actually uh, better for robotic. So, and the cost was essentially the same. Um, another study looking at single surgeon experience, looking at average OR time was about 99 uh, minutes, but it got better with time, and I'll show you a little bit more. Uh, narcotics, uh, this is a big issue, especially in this country, uh, only for three days uh, in this study. Uh, so, uh, this is another study looking at uh, 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 robotic, uh, just post-operative uh, groin pain in robotic uh, hernias versus open, uh, and the patients in the robotic repair actually uh, did a lot better. So um, this video here is just going to show you how I secure the mesh. Uh, and I do secure my meshes. I always use the same extra large piece, which is uh, 12 by uh, 17 centimeters. Uh, and uh, then I'll just um, suture this straight through the pubis. One suture there, tie it, and I usually use a permanent suture. I think you can uh, use whatever you think uh, is going to keep the mesh in place. Put one suture out laterally. So it's the same way I would do this laparoscopically. I usually do a three-point fixation of the mesh. You can see that you want this to, you know, really, if you're going to be putting a suture in there, you don't have to, you know, make sure that it goes really deep into the abdominal wall, but uh, just so it really doesn't move. And then I put one suture immediately. But you can see that that mesh, it's just really important that it really lays nicely in that pocket and that it doesn't curve at all um, at the bottom um, before the peritoneum um, desufflate. So. so we just fix it in three different spots and can slide the knots and it's just a lot of fun. Uh, it's like playing a video game. And I, I never played video games. I was always studying. So, um, But for the kids, you know, they're, <laughs> they're going to be, this is going to be even more fun for them. Um, so uh, we actually, in our institution, uh, there's several of us to do laparoscopic inguinal hernias. Uh, so we looked at our data because we all actually use uh, different techniques for closing that peritoneum. Uh, so uh, some of us use a stapler, some of us use tacks, and some of us suture. So uh, uh, Dr. Uman, who's in, uh, in the audience, and uh, Sam Ross, they actually looked at uh, these repairs uh, between suture staples and tacks, and actually the patients who had suture repair of the peritoneum had, had the least amount of pain um, at two weeks. So there is a little bit of benefit potentially in not driving the tacks or the staples in the abdominal wall. Uh, and then the last part of this procedure, you've seen this many times, it's just you've not seen it this clearly, uh, is that you're just closing the peritoneum. Uh, it's just crystal clear, but you know, it's uh, a lot of fun. Use a barbed suture. 
Uh, make sure to close any holes in the peritoneum, which you can also visualize very easily. Um, and, uh, and that's it for this uh, repair. So um, more uh, papers supporting the robotic repair, uh, looking at OR time, complications, you know, it's safe. Uh, so definitely robotic repair is safe and it's something that you can consider. Um, this is a uh, study looking um, at uh, doing this in morbidly obese patients and robotic hair, pay, uh, repair uh, compared to open actually had less uh, complications. If you want to focus on the RVUs, actually the best way to make money fixing inguinals is actually open. Uh, so, or, or in kids, so you can do pediatric inguinals or you can do open. Uh, but if you look at the RVUs, so robotic and laparoscopic, it's, it's the same. Uh, but the nice thing that you can do uh, robotically or laparoscopically is that maybe there's a bilateral hernia, so you actually have a chance to charge for two. Uh, so one, one more argument for us. Um, if you're doing this, uh, and I showed this article earlier, uh, there is a significant improvement in your OR time. So you are definitely getting better. I think it's hard to do this one case and then abandon it for a month and then do another case. It's gonna be very hard to get better. And that's when you know everybody's gonna criticize you how you're taking two hours to fix an inguinal hernia. So I think if you're gonna do it, if you become committed to it, uh, ju just stick with it and your OR time, docking time and everything is really gonna decrease. Um, so in conclusion, I think robotic uh, repair is definitely safe, uh, and uh, I think it's a really good platform for um, surgeons who want to transition from open uh, to a minimally invasive repair and have that to offer that to patients, especially those that have bilateral repairs. I think it's excellent for teaching. I think uh, the trainees that we have right now are probably going to be a lot more comfortable learning on the robot than they will laparoscopic, but time will tell. I think we need to track our outcomes and, uh, and just uh, make sure if this is the technique you want to use, just do it all the time. Thank you.